Hey everyone, I'm a small lizard, and this is a re-recording because I forgot to hit the record button on the actual day. And once again, please go to the worksheet and the MF26 using this QR code right here. And if you'd like to, you can check out my YouTube channel for the other H2Math videos as well. All right. So I'm a small lizard and I graduated two years ago with further math, math can be cons. And I'm the author of this math skill set on Inkis Discord. So if you go to the resource channel and scroll up, you see my skill sets there. And of course, more to come. All right. I've actually done most of the remaining topics already. We're just left with uploading them. All right. And I'm studying math and stats somewhere. Somewhere. Okay. All right. Without further ado, let's carry on with the taste of course on differentiation. I'll be going through some of the techniques that you've already learned and also expand them in the H2Math syllabus because the techniques you learn in O levels carries over to H2Math as well. Not only that, I'll be teaching you actually all of the differentiation techniques you need to know in H2Math, just shy of the application questions. All right. So essentially, this part is the whole entire, or I should say, a crash course of differentiation except for the application question, all right? So what is differentiation? Pretty sure some of you have read it, are familiar with it. You guys can, might have remembered it as the gradient at a point of a curve, or more specifically, the instantaneous rate of change. Instantaneous because you have, through differentiation, you can find the rate of change or the gradient at a particular value of x, for example, all right? And how did differentiation really come about? And why is it related to gradient? Is the idea of the fundamental theory of differentiation its first principles. So what is the first principles? Let's say we have an axis and we don't have the coordinates yet, all right? Because we know that we can have coordinates that are not just x and y. We can have, let's say, g and h or a and b. But for simplicity's sake, Let's say we have the graph y equals to fx, and we know that we have y as the vertical axis and x as the horizontal axis, and not forgetting our wonderful origin. And what's the idea of differentiation? We know that it is the gradient, all right? So let's see how first principles really led to differentiation being the rate of change. Let's say you want to take the gradient of the particular curve at the particular point, x, comma, fx. And what we would do right last time is we will take a ruler and then draw a tangent that is a straight line. And we will take the gradient of this particular straight line and approximate it to the gradient of the point in the curve. And of course we know that this is not really an accurate way to actually find the gradient because we are relying on human instinct and human judgment which is well, we all know, horrible, all right? So what's a more accurate way to find the gradient of a curve at a particular point? And this is how differentiation come about, the idea of first principles. We first take a nearby point, let's say x plus h, fx plus h. And we basically use the very basic idea of connecting these two points using a straight line and then finding the gradient. Now, clearly, using if you look at a green line, it is very far from the gradient, right? It's not even close to the tangent to the point. So it's not really a good guide. But if we take a very near point, let's say somewhere around here, you start to notice that the line that joins these two points, the old point and the nearby point, would actually get very close to the tangent, right? To the actual tangent to the curve at a particular point. And therefore, as this point gets closer to the original point x, fx, the gradient of the line that connects both of these points won't then approach the gradient of the graph at that particular point because the line that connects these two points would then get closer to the actual tangent of the graph at that particular point as well. All right. So how do you represent it? mathematically, all right? And it's the idea of what it mean by close. So when we talk about a close point, we know that 
we have x plus h as the second point. And then the idea is for this h to get very, very, very close to zero. All right. So how do you represent this idea of the h getting very close to zero? Now, first, what is the gradient of the line that connects two points? Quite simple, right? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. y2 being fx plus h, y1 being fx, and x2 being x plus h minus x will give us h. And the idea of h becoming zero is basically finding the limit of this function as h approaches zero. So you simply write lim h approaches zero, essentially limit of this particular function as h becomes zero. And that is first principles. dy dx equals to the limit as h approaches zero of fx plus h minus fx over h. All right. So that is first principles using this quote unquote formula, which you can actually very easily derive, right? If you actually remember the whole idea of first principles, taking a nearby point, comparing its gradient to the actual gradient as h approaches zero. So how does first principles is tested in the H2MF syllabus? Now, usually for first principles, you're only going to be dealing with algebraic functions, right? You're not going to be dealing with trigonometry, exponential, nor logarithm. All right, so don't worry about those because those require some other knowledge of limits, which is actually not in the H2MF syllabus uh, per se. All right. So mainly algebraic functions. So what's the first step, all right? So let's say we have this first example, differentiate x squared by first principles. Now we know from A, or rather from A math, we know that we can use the power rule, bring down the power, reduce the power by one, and then differentiate inside, right? So we know that differentiating x squared is two x, but we want it done by first principles. First thing first, you just let y equals to x squared. All right, you can let fx equals x squared. In fact, that's what I'm going to do in the next example. But let's start with y first. And again, gradient of the point and a nearby point. So x plus h whole thing squared minus x squared over h. And then we let a nearby point, so h approaches 0. And that is the gradient, right? the first derivative. So what do we do from here? Well, and there's really nothing much you can do except for expanding the numerator. And then you notice that you have x squared minus x squared, so you cancel those out. And you notice that you'll be left with 2hx plus h squared. You can factorize our h and divide it from the denominator, leaving you with 2x plus h. And now we can finally apply this limit, letting h equal to 0. And you notice that you get back the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. And that corresponds and that matches our knowledge of the power rule with x squared. Fantastic, right? So let's use another example. You might want to pause the recording now or pause the video now and try to solve this by your own. And I'll show you the first step, all right? Now, instead of using y, I use fx. And of course, fx would then give us f prime. Same thing, gradient, nearby point, and the original point. So x plus h cubed minus x cubed over h as the limit of this particular fraction or this particular function as h approaches zero. Same thing, expand the top. And well, experience tells me that I can just simply simplify to this because if you remember your binomial, this x cubed plus 3hx squared plus 3h squared x plus h cubed. All right, the Pascal triangle is extremely useful when it comes to the binomial expansion, right? It's good to remember some of the numbers. 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. All right, notice there's a line of symmetry in the center, so it's actually quite simple. Then from here, similarly, you just need to factorize all the h on top and divide it by the denominator, leaving you with 3x squared plus 3hx plus h squared. And I think you guys should know what to do from now. Apply h equals to zero, and you notice it matches the power rule as well. Right, derivative of x cubed is 3x squared from the power rule, and mainly from the first principles as well. All right, so first principles, done and dusted. Now we move on to the skills. And 
From AMF, you should remember these four skills, power rule, chain rule, product, quotient. Power rule, bring down the power by one, reduce the power, bring down the power rather, reduce the power by one and differentiate inside. And the idea of differentiating inside comes from chain rule. And the idea is like eating a cake, all right? You eat from the outside and then going in, all right? I mean, if you eat from inside and then outside, let me know, all right? I would like to have that skill as well. Otherwise, differentiate outside, then inside. So it is easy to remember differentiation skills if you actually find these old patterns. And in fact, it is actually a very vital skill in H2Math where you can find your own ways of learning, makes it easier during the exam and also easier for you to learn and bring a bit of humor to your learning as well. All right, product rule, quotient rule. What I'd like to say is uh, first come, first serve, aka first term will differentiate first. And the other idea is product is plus, quotient is minus, right? I mean, it comes from very basic arithmetic. You learn in primary school, two times three is three plus three. Six divided by two is, well, three plus three, uh, six minus three minus three as well. All right, so product gives you a larger number, quotient gives you a smaller number per se. Of course, you don't talk about multiplying by a decimal or dividing by a decimal, so we're looking at integers, all right? So I just want me to remember it. I just, I just basically remember that it's plus and minus, okay? It's very simple. And what do I mean by first term to differentiate? First of first come, first serve, I think, is easier to elaborate with an example. So let's say u and v are each functions of x. First come, first serve, first term is u, so u prime v, right? You will differentiate u first. Product rule, so plus sign, then you differentiate the other term, v prime u. Likewise, for the quotient rule, the first term is simply the numerator. All right, so I'm going to differentiate the numerator first, and then because it's quotient, it is minus, then v prime u, and only thing to remember for quotient rule is to divide by the square of the denominator as well, so you have v square in the denominator. All right, so quite simple, right? Hopefully you can remember these now. First thing learned in differentiation in A math is algebraic functions, and you still see them in H2 math. All right. Now, one example in the worksheet 2x squared minus 3 plus x power 4 over x squared. If you have done this in the quotient rule, congratulations. You took the not way out. Hopefully, you can see that hey, long division 2x squared multiplied by x squared is 2, and so on and so forth. Minus 3x power minus 2 plus x squared and you can easily differentiate this all right if you differentiate this it's going to be quite simple 6x power minus 3 plus 2x okay the algebraic so in the sense that right, fx is an algebraic function but in the h2 math syllabus the rules is the same are the same right it is still 1 over ln a f prime over fx just that now fx can be any particular function all right so take note of that Otherwise, it's actually the same. Similarly, trigonometry, sine, cosine, tangent, ax plus b, axis and radians. And I'll elaborate that later on because trigonometry, you learn a lot more stuff. You learn all six trigonometry derivatives and in degrees as well, and in the inverse functions, but only for sine, cosine, and tangent inverse. Exponential, same rule, all right? e power fx is still, you get back the same function, times the derivative of the power. So maybe something that's unfamiliar is the ability to actually let's represent it as a original function, where y is essentially the first function, ex, e power fx. All right, so this is particularly useful. We are dealing with the Maclaurin series, um, and I won't be doing talking about that now. All right. Okay, for example, the dx of ln x plus root x squared minus one. So we know that in the natural law, it's simply f prime over f. So what I'd like to do first is just simply write down the original function. So there'll be in the denominator. And with this, right, you can actually differentiate easily. Because you have something to refer to. Differentiate x, give me back 1. Plus power rule, so this was power half. Minus 1 becomes power minus half. So denominator x squared minus 1. Power rule, so I brought out the power, which is half. And then the important thing is to differentiate inside. 
differentiate inside is 2x, all right? And then don't forget to multiply by the power, which I didn't multiply earlier because I like to do it that way as well. x over root x squared minus 1. Now, you can't leave an answer like this. For obvious reasons, there's a fraction in a fraction. So, how do you simplify this? Quite simple. How do you get rid of this fraction? Let's multiply by root x squared minus 1 on both sides. So you multiply by root x squared minus 1 on both sides. Okay, and what happens? Now, you might be tempted to do it at the bottom as well. But what my advice is, settle the top first. You might see something. So if you were to multiply by the top first, you notice that you get root x squared minus 1 plus x. Do you see something? Hopefully you do. You notice that the numerator here, after multiplying by root x squared minus 1, gives you back the old denominator, which means instead of multiplying the root x squared minus 1 to the bottom as well, I'm going to leave it out outside because now you notice that you can just simply let this equals to 1. And then the derivative is simply 1 over root x squared minus 1. All right. So when I talk about techniques, when I talk about familiarity, this is what I mean. All right. Doing it systematically and doing it smartly. All right. I'm not saying I'm that smart, but doing it in a way that is more intuitive for yourself. That will help you when you're doing the questions as well. All right. So in terms of instinct, you can build it. All right. And it's done this way. Okay. Of course, you won't get these out of questions all the time. I'm just putting this from further math. Of course, the question isn't just simply differentiate this. It was part of a working. Now, exponential, e power x cosine x squared. Same thing, all right? Differentiate outside and inside. We know that in exponential, you get the same function. So again, what I like to do? Well, write down the same function. Differentiate the power. Now we have a product root. First come, first serve. Differentiating x gives us 1, so cosine x squared. Now I differentiate cosine x, x squared. Cosine becomes minus sine x squared. Chain rule, differentiating inside, 2x. And then multiplying by the first factor, which is x, so 2x squared sine x squared. All right, simple. Last question for exponential logarithm. x power x. I highly suggest that you pause this video right now and give it a shot because this is an important example with an equally important technique. Hope you've done it already. Otherwise, you might have tried to do either of these. Oh, power. Let's try to use the power root. All right, we bring down the power. We reduce the power by one. Differentiate inside, differentiate x, it gives us one. Oh, hey, aha x power x again. Wrong. Wrong. It's not. Okay then. Hey, exponential. I get back the same function. I need to multiply by the base, logarithm of the base. <gasps> That's it. Nope. Also wrong. What now? Why? If you look at the power root, the power is a constant, not a function. If you look at the exponential rule, the base is a constant, or to be exact, a positive constant, not a function. So what can we do? All right? Clearly the power rule isn't going to work. Right? We can't change the power to a constant, but we can actually change the base to a constant and then use the exponential rule and hence I label it under exponential. So how? All right. And basically we use the idea of this identity. If we have ln a equals to b, uh, we know that a equals to e power b. Right. And the idea is if ln a equals to b, then we know that a equals to e power ln a. So the idea is very simple. All right. 
let's say we have A, it simply equals to, let's say you want to change it to base B, it is log B and then whatever the base was. All right. So now we have x power x. We can simply change this to, well, make it easier. Base E. So base E. So it's log E, which is simply ln. Base was x, so we have ln x. Power. Right. So we have E ln x power x, which is simply E ln x times E ln x x times. So we have x ln x. All right. So the power is simply x ln x now. And now it's an exponential rule, so we get rid of the same function, which is simply x power x, right? e power x ln x is x power x. Differentiating the power, which is x ln x. So power rule, first come, first serve. Differentiate x gives us 1 times ln x, plus differentiate ln x is 1 over x times x is simply 1. All right, so we use the identity of changing the base of an exponential by bringing up the power with its logarithm. All right. Moving on to trigonometry, where fx is in radians. So why I'm gonna I'm gonna pair three of the six three pairs of two. So we have sine and cosine together. Why? Well, sine fx gives us cosine fx. Cosine fx gives us minus sine. And of course, chain rule differentiating in sine. fx becomes f prime as well. And I paired tangent and secant, right? If you notice, tangent gives us secant square, secant gives us secant tangent, and secant is found in the MF26. Likewise, cotangent gives us minus cosecant square, cosecant gives us minus cosecant cotangent. So you notice that actually group 2 and group 3 shares a lot of similarities, right? Tangent and cotangent, they give us the square of the partner, cosecant gives us the partner and itself, same likewise for secant, itself and tangent, all right? But of course, group three has the minus signs. So if we're to, let's say, look at these two examples, all right, very simple. First one, sine ln x, you want to find the first derivative, again, outside, then inside. Sine becomes cosine. Division inside, ln x becomes one over x, simple. Cotangent becomes minus cosecant square. Now, differentiate inside, which is the product rule, right? First term, differentiate first, so 2x ex. Next term, differentiating ex, give us the same term, so x square ex. Simplify this, so we can factor out x ex minus x e power x cosecant square x squared ex 2 plus x. Okay, moving on to degrees. So we were looking at fx being in radians, but now we're going to look at them being in degrees. So very simple, if we just need to simply convert it to radians by multiplying pi over 180, things should be quite easy to remember pi is congruent to 180 degrees, so every degree is simply pi over 180. All right, so let's say we assign x degrees. First thing first is to simply write this to pi over 180 times x. Then we differentiate, so sine becomes cosine. And well, you can write back pi, over one, pi x over 180, but you should change it back to the x degrees as well. Then you differentiate pi over 180 times x, which is basically pi over 180. All right, so that's that. Now secant, bracket x squared plus 2x plus 2 whole thing degrees. Again, secant becomes secant x tangent x. So you get secant x squared plus 2x plus 2 degrees tangent x squared plus 2x plus 2 degrees, and don't forget to differentiate inside. So differentiate inside, you get 2x plus 2. And because it's in degrees, you multiply by pi over 180. And you notice that, hey, I can factor out 2 here from 2x plus 2 and divide it by 180. So I simply get pi over 90 x plus 1. All right, okay, let's write this properly.
Right, fantastic. Now, verse Trigo. Sign in verse and cosine inverse, very similar. All right, the classic root one minus function square. All right, but the difference between cosine and cosine inverse, and sine inverse, cosine inverse has a negative sign, sine inverse has no negative sign. All right, it's actually very similar to the sine and cosine by itself, right? Sine becomes cosine, cosine becomes minus sine. All right, so it kind of carries over here as well. The proof you can actually find it using a technique that we'll be going through later on. Tangent inverse, again, the classic one plus function square. All right, and of course the chain for all three, f prime on top. So let's take a look at these examples, Ten in, tangent inverse ex. So what I like to do first is the denominator of course, right? One plus e two x, one plus ex squared. So ex squared is simply e two x. Differentiate ex gives the back ex, very simple. For x between 0 and pi over 2, find a derivative of sine inverse cosine x. Okay, root 1 minus the function, right, cosine squared x. Differentiate inside, cosine x become minus sine x. Okay, if you leave an answer like this, it is wrong. Because we know from the Pythagoras identity, 1 minus cosine squared is sine square. 1 minus cosine square is sine square, so you get root sine square x. And if you immediately write this down without knowing why, you are wrong. Okay, let me explain why. If we have root a square, it is actually a piecewise function, aka it depends. It is a if a is bigger than zero. It is minus a if a is less than zero. Why is that so? Because we want root a square. Root a square must be a positive number, right? A square root of a number is always positive, unless you find the negative square root. All right, then this will then always be negative. But if it's a square, we know that a can either be positive or negative. So we need to check, is it positive or is it negative? In this case, the a here is sine, sine x. Looking at the domain of x or the range of values of x is in the first quadrant where sine x is positive. As such, the positive square root of sine square x is simply sine x. If instead we have, let's say, in the third quadrant, where it's between pi and 3 pi over 2, then we know that sine x is less than 0, root sine square x equals to minus sine x, right? Because this is negative, negative, negative gives us positive, all right? And from here, so going back to this question, first quadrant, so root sine square x is simply sine x because sine x is already positive and it's simply minus 1. All right, so that is inverse trigo, and that is some reminders, right, root a squared. Of course, of course, you know, just as a side note, root 4 is still 2, x squared equals to 4, x is still plus minus 2. Why? Because, same reason, right, root x squared equals to 4, or root x squared equals to 2, rather, and we know that x can be plus 2 or minus 2. Right? Implicit differentiation. This is a technique that we've actually been doing. Right? The idea of implicit differentiation is simply differentiating respect to a different variable. So y equals to fx. Actually, what we do is actually to apply the operator d dx on both sides d dx of y on the left, d dx of fx on the right. On the left, d dx of y is simply dy dx, and on the right, simply f prime x. All right, in implicit differentiation, all the tools that we've learned are still applicable, right? Exponential is to get by the same function and differentiate the power, logarithm, f prime over fx. Okay, so first example, differentiating sine t with respect to x. 
So what do you mean the skills are still applicable? Sign still becomes cosine. Differentiate inside. All right, t if it's a variable, you differentiate inside. dt dx, right? Similar to this. Next is that d dx of e power x times y. Exponential, you get back the same function. Now we differentiate the power product rule x times y. All right, so differentiate x first, you get back 1 times y, plus x remains there, y becomes dy dx. All right, don't forget you're differentiating with respect to x, dy dx. Okay, so be careful of the implicit differentiation. Do not make the mistake of not multiplying the respective derivative as well when you're differentiating with respect to a different and keyword different variable. If y is a constant, y is a constant, right? Then we know that if let's say y is a constant for this one, it's simply y e x y, right? But this is only if y is a constant. So it is only when you need, it's only a variable that you need to actually differentiate the variable and add or rather multiply the derivative. All right, so what implicit differentiation can be used then? So let's say we have an equation and we have to find dy dx. We just need to, I guess it's quite obvious, differentiate both sides with respect to x. So if x squared minus 2xy plus 2y squared equals to 4, so we apply d dx on both sides. Left side, first term, quite simple, power rule, bring out the power, reduce the power by 1 and differentiate side, 2x. Next one x times y, so product. Differentiate x gives us 1, so y. Differentiate y, dy, dx. Do not forget that you're differentiating with respect to x. All right. So whenever you're differentiating with respect to another variable, always make it a habit to remind yourself to multiply by the derivative. Likewise, 2y squared. Again, power rule. Bring down the power, so we get 2 times 2, 4. Reduce the power, and don't forget to differentiate inside. Many people forget to add, or rather multiply, by dy dx, because, eh, power rule lah, still 2x squared. No, it's not. It is now y. All right, so remember that. Obviously, differentiating a constant is 0. Now, I'm going to cut you the simplification. So I'm going to do it. We're skipping the steps. So let's see. All right. So two, okay. So two y minus x on top is simply y minus x. Of course, if you want to do it properly, go ahead. Next up, two x cubed plus e power y plus one over y equals to zero. Again, d dx on both sides. First term, bring out the power, reduce the power by one, and differentiate inside six x squared. Exponential, you get back the same function. Once again, do not forget to multiply by the derivative of the power. And because it's in the different variable, dy dx. Likewise, power root, 1 over y square, differentiate inside, differentiating y, with respect to x, dy dx. All right, again, simplify this. 6x square over 1 over y square minus e power y. Again, fraction and fraction, simplify it, 6y square x square over 1 minus y square e power y. Of course, you can even write it as this way, 6y square or x square, y square x square over y square e power y minus 1. It's just simply just factorize out the minus sign. And we now move on to the last skill that you need in H2 differentiation, parametric differentiation. So what is parametric differentiation? The idea comes from parametric equations, where x and y are each defined by a function with a common parameter. In this case, we have t as a common parameter, or maybe in the layman's term, common variable. So x equals to gt and y equals to ht. And we simply use the idea of rate of change from the AMAP syllabus as well 
where dy dx is simply dy dt divided by dx dt. And once again, just as a friendly reminder, do not treat these as fractions by trying to cancel them out. All right, you can treat them like fractions, fractions in your head, but don't show it explicitly that you treated them like fractions. All right, so dy dt h prime, dx dt g prime. Simple, right? F x equals to t squared plus log t and y equals to t sine t. All right, so dy dt, or rather dy dx, equals to dy dt over dx dt. All right, so let's do dy dt first. Product rule. Differentiate the first, first term, which is t becomes 1 times sine t. Now, differentiate the other factor, which is sine t becomes cosine t, so we get t cosine t. In the denominator, which is the first derivative of x, so dx dt. Power rule, 2t, and then logarithm, f prime over fx, so 1 over t, or ft, or f prime t over ft, rather. Again, you can't leave an answer like this, because there's a fraction in a fraction. Times throughout by t on both sides, t sine or rather, you can actually factorize the t on top. We don't have to really add it in. So t bracket sine t plus t cosine t. Again, be careful if your plus sign look like a t, so don't get confused by yourself. Then below, 2t squared plus 1. Last one. x equals to a sine cubed theta, and y equals to a cosine cubed theta. All right, so not always is t. It can be other variables as well. So dy dx, again, numerator, dy d theta, so a, power rule, 3 cosine square theta. Chain rule, differentiating cosine theta, minus sine theta, right? Cosine becomes minus sine. Denominator, dx d theta, again, a, power rule, 3 sine, which I should bracket this as well, 3 sine square theta. Differentiate inside, sine becomes cosine. Theta is 1, so theta becomes 1, so theta. So from here, simply just do some very fun cancelling. 3a goes away. Cosine square theta divided by cosine theta. Sine theta divided by sine square theta. And you're left with minus sine cosine theta over sine theta. You can't leave it like this because you can convert it to minus cotangent theta. That marks the end of this crash course of differentiation technique. Uh, well, I didn't even record the meeting. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, you have record everyone but yours, but yours. What's the hardest topic in math? I wouldn't speak from my own experience because, yeah, but hardest topic. The classic hardest topic in math is always vectors. I kind of understand yet not understand why. The reason why is hardest the hardest topic in math or vec why vectors are the hardest topic is because there are a lot of contexts that you need to break down and that's what gets people uh, off. All right. But really vectors is actually farmable in the sense that because vector questions tend to have a lot of parts that is very guided. So you can kind of score kind of get score here and there. All right, because I didn't share my screen yet. Give me a moment. Hardest topic in math, again, vectors, uh, but really, right, take, take it from me, right, vectors, the idea is just think of it as like graphs, okay? So if you think of it that way, in idea of intersection, idea of gradient and direction vectors, you guys will understand. You guys can head over to the, okay, I actually don't recommend you watching the vectors crash course now. Um, don't worry about it. Periodically, maybe that's the, maybe in the first half of next year, I will start to release some vector content videos because I haven't done that for my YouTube channel yet. So, yeah, you guys can stay tuned for that. All right, so vectors. Actually, if you really get good at vectors, you actually find your own ways of learning. Uh, it's actually pretty easy. All right. How many topics are there? 10 pure topics and... No, should I say yeah, 6 or, or 4? Okay. Our topics six stats topics right six in a sense that for the stats is probability and combination so that's well that's a standalone hell uh discrete random variables and look at basically generic drbs and binomial theorem and then you have normal distribution that's kind of spans three chapters so normal distribution itself 
idea of sampling, there's another one, and then hypothesis testing. Quite farmable and quite uh, easy. A, the last one, which is actually the CLT for the last two years, for this year and 2020, but I've, I'm have i the pre-COVID uh, batch, now, so I'm graduating 2019, so I skipped COVID. Skipped COVID. And it's basically linear law, right? Linear regression is just a linear law. Linear law it's uh, quite, quite farmable. I don't want to just key calculator, really. Hello, can you? Yes, I can upload these slides with or without my annotations. Uh, I don't know why I didn't record. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. Since vectors was not tested, okay, I, I'm going to be very frank. You don't need O level vectors, right? A level vectors, right, is, is, is actually, I would say, right, it's actually learnable just from the start to the end. All right, it's like, because O level vectors, you only deal with like, what, basic addition, subtraction, midpoint theorem, ratio theorem, I believe. I don't know, it's been a long time since I looked at A math. And it's only in two dimension, all right? A level vectors is a, is a, is another ball game. And I think it's easy, it might be easier for it to just learn it from scratch. Right? Yeah. How do you effectively study math? How much time do you <laughs> practice spending math? <laughs> Sorry, spend practicing math every week. Okay, I will not include my FM stuff. So you can kind of really understand how much I actually do math every day. Like, all right. Now, how to effectively study math? Now, the idea right, is always to find your own way of learning and your understanding, like pattern creation. Like, for example, the differentiation, first term goes first, differentiate outside to inside. All right. And the idea of learning these techniques and making these reminders of yourself as well. All right. The teachers or your tutors, right, we eat they teach you through a lecture form or through videos, right? They are likely to remind you of certain things. Take those reminders seriously, right? Because those reminders, right, it's kind of a cool thing. If you remember something that they specifically try to remember, you can kind of remember the things before that, all right? So it's like, let's say you differentiate outside. Let's say for implicit, uh, implicit differentiation, you differentiate a different variable, you must include a dy dx, right? That kind of reminds you of that, hey, I need to differentiate inside to begin with. So it's kind of like, chain, it's like you know, you go five and then you have to cover the rest of the ground. So like, almost like, sorry for the nerdy analogy, like integration under the uh, area under the curve. Like. Yeah. So how much time I spend, spend practicing math every week? Uh, I can't remember, but it's not a lot because you hear I just, breeze through the math, sorry. But uh, it can, but I'll use my first chapter as an example because that one was quite new, because new to JC, so the content's a bit different. Well, for the first chapter, the tutorial took three hours huh? because it was because of a series and it's like a lot of questions. I think it was like 17 questions, I can't remember. I can't remember. Yeah, so that was slightly insane. Um, but if, if possible, it's good to look through your math notes first and then find your way of learning, right? Always understand the ideas behind it and how to apply it, right? The good thing about H2 math is that it's, you actually pay attention to the questions. Uh, it's kind of a predictable kind of context. Right? Like differential equations, the context questions that you can kind of predict, the, you, won't, you won't predict the exact context and the exact numbers, but you can kind of predict how to use them, right? So that is the whole idea, yeah. So actually H2 math, right? It's, predictable and it says that the question types are predictable, the context are not. Yeah. Uh, qualification test for FM. Okay, I I really hate to say this. I really, I didn't take the qualification test for FM for my year because they didn't uh, prove, give it to us. Anything I can do to prefer, prepare for it, I would say is, that, okay, difficulty wise, they test on your, not so much about your current knowledge, but your ability to tackle challenging questions and your ability to showcase that thinking, that logical thinking. My advice for the qualification test in FMF, go through with what you know and then think of it logically, right? It's going to be slightly a bit, slightly abstract and slightly novel for, actually probably very novel for you. Uh, exercise that freedom of expression, right? Anything goes really like, there's no more like, oh, you have to follow this particular set of steps or you have, you cannot skip steps or whatever thing. Right? A-level are free to go, just to let you guys know. You can skip like a few steps, but I mean, don't, don't skip all the steps. I don't just say, oh, it's integrated. Uh, you, you do definite integrals, then you just write your right answer. 
possible lah as a like practice lah, right? You you kind of like you know, you look at the definite integral, you know the answer already. Can but don't do it in A levels. Ah, some steps you need to know. But some steps you can skip. Like just now, like my implicit differentiation, right? How I went from just straight away differentiating it and then just getting the derivative at the end. That is possible. All right. Anything I can do to prepare for it? I don't know. <laughs> I okay. Just just prepare for it. Maybe just go through your normal techniques and stuff, right? Um. I don't know how they're going to mark that qualification test. As long as you showcase that you have fundamental knowledge and idea, right? Yeah, fine. The test is meant for you to struggle, just like uh, UK interviews. Usually, how do people do in math? They're quite badly. <laughs> Very badly at the start of G1. Even in the top schools, from what I heard, uh, 50 something. At the starting of J1, uh, even at promos, you can you only uh, increase it a little. But by come prelims, it's like uh, 60 plus, 70 plus, 80 plus. Yeah. Because uh, the jump from A math to H2 is uh, is big. Though the types of questions in terms of novelty is uh, big as well. It's, yeah, it's slightly more tedious, slightly more reading. So some of you may not be used to it. But don't worry, la, right? Just because you don't do it in the first part of J1, then, then you get demoralize yourself. Don't worry, it's just a learning thing. Right? Give yourself the space and time to make mistakes and grow. That's why I always advise uh, incoming J1s or actually even J2s as well. All right, it's always a learning process, uh, GC. You are at the prime time to make mistakes, not just in academics as well, uh, in, uh, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, life and uh, in general. Uh, right? Because you know, these two years is basically going to be Kind of like your last two years in a confined bubble. Yeah. So cherry these two years, guys. So yeah, just don't be demoralized. Uh don't be shocked either if you get like very bad marks. Uh it's always a message. Uh, it's always a, like telling you that hey, uh may, always try to find a you know, you have maybe these things good and then, uh these things that are good and then some some things that are bad and all that stuff. Yeah. Learning process. My advice is uh, when you're done with a topic, right? Don't even like, ha, bye, and then, you know, forget about it completely, right? It's good to at least like, you know, do like one or two questions every two days or three days regarding the old uh, concepts as well. Then you at least can keep it fresh in your mind. And by the time you come to exam, oh, just easy, all right? Now, uh, just as an aside, now is it possible to do the paper within three hours? Definitely yes. Is it possible to do it under and under two and a half hours? Yes. You don't need to actually use all three hours, now, right? If you do enough, come come A levels, now, so don't worry about it. Uh, personal, oh, I shouldn't say anyway. All right. So page two math. The trick is to just. It's not constant practice where you have to do it almost every day. When I say constant practice, I mean by interval practice. Lah. So like three days, do one question of every chapter. You can even split it within these three days. Lah. Don't have to do like everything in, in, in like one, one day. Oh, wow. yeah. That's also true for like the other subjects as well. So don't worry about it. Should I assign one complete day to a subject or a few? Oh, okay, never ever do. Okay. Never ever assign one full day on one subject, right? Okay. Depends on where you, on what stage you are at. Okay. If you're at the, if you're like you know not not really exam period yet, all right. Half hour, one hour, look through the questions for each subject is fine. Okay. Don't have to do it like. Oh, I do that, I do that, or tomorrow I do math only, then only that I do chem or whatever only. It's not going to work out, right? You're going to get burnt out at the end, right? You're, you're, it's like, you know, law of decreasing, <laughs> diminishing returns, right? You learn that econs, if you ever take econs. The more you do math, right, on a certain day, or on a more particular subject, right, your efficiency just de de exponentially decays. It's an exponential decay. Right? And you're going to lose that motivation fast, right? So, Break it up, lah, right? It's also tactical, tactical as well. You know, you do a bit of each and everything, right? Keeps your mind not only entertained, but it's also easier for you to remember the knowledge for each subject as well. Yeah. 
because it's like you know let's say you lose 10 percent of your or like you mean 40 percent of your knowledge every time you sleep okay if you have like let's say everything at once right let's say you dedicate one whole day in math right 100 percent of math you only retain 60 percent so let's say you study 10 topics right you, you leave out four topics gone then you return to learn four, four topics again whereas you learn one topic you, you lose like 10 percent of that one topic and then you do it every day right you notice that your net gain uh, is way 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 more than you cram everything on go than you cram everything so it's also a better way to do that because you know in H2 math the topics are interlinked as well sometimes I mean the questions you can give is quite interlinked here and there like yesterday they not that one okay that was not really a, a perfect example but let's say if you look at uh integration integration can also come in with functions can also come in with translations can also come in with differentiation as well right so do not assign one one whole day just for a subject and not even a few hours, I would say like one hour, two hours. Yeah. Maybe not even like two whole hours at one go. Uh, break it up to one hour, one hour. Right. Give yourself the subject break, uh, like the call. Yeah. Unless, unless, right, you you, you really all the subjects all good really, uh, like super perfect really. Uh, uh, then okay law. <laughs> then I won't stop you, uh, right? But so but that's like you know during non-peak period, uh, like called exam period. When you're in exam period, okay, exam period is a bit different. Okay, exam period. You shouldn't also do that, right? What you should do for exam period is, for math, right? If they give you like, let's say topical questions, don't do, you know, topic by topic, right? Do like two from each topic every day or one for each topic every day. Always count the questions in each topic lah. Then once you're done in that, right? Then what you're gonna do is, let's say for the practice papers, you do one practice paper today and another practice paper of another subject, right? Then the next day you do another topic, right? But not the same two topics that you did. Uh, that day. All right. So let's say you do math and physics on that day itself. Next day you don't do math and physics, all right? But of course you take further math, then huh, math and physics, and tomorrow further math, then math again, then further math. Quite entertaining, lah. But yeah. Okay. And always give that break, lah. All right. Give yourself that break. Uh, between papers, uh, you 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 definitely need it, and you find yourself get, not getting burnt out fast. Yeah. And last advice, all right? Uh, next year, oh no, 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 two years later when you get in J2, or whenever, or three years later, I know there's some three students around. Whenever, when you're in J2, all right, after your first mid years, some block tests, some of you call it block tests or common tests, start studying after youth day. Okay, start studying at 70%, 80% every day. All right, why? You start studying 70%, 80% from mid years in J2, right? Come to A levels, you're confident. You'll be confident. You'll be done really. Then A levels, you just tone it down, right? 60%, 50%, 40%. Then you won't burn out during A levels. You won't even burn out during prelims. Because it's consistent effort, right? That adds up together. Instead of like slowly, then suddenly you peak. Oh, the peak uh, is going to be very dangerous because once you try to peak at prelims, and go all the way, right? It's not that it's too late, lah. It's doable, it's still doable. I know a few examples that I know a few examples that 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 work for them, but it's not healthy, lah, right? They also struggle emotionally during this final sudden burst, right? But if you go it consistent, uniformly, come A levels, you be come A levels, it'll be like this. Then it's very easy. A levels, very manageable. Okay.